Okay, so let's begin with a definition, ambition. One definition is that it's a strong feeling of wanting to be successful in life and to achieve great things. So as mathematicians, let me see if I like this better. Now that's harder. What sorts of ambitions do we have? Well, fame and fortune. Okay, that's not one of my ambitions, but I know it is of some people. Solving hard and interesting problems. That's more like what I want to do when I can. Constructing elegant proofs. I'm a number theorist, so I'm really an algebraist at heart. I want elegance. Success as an expositor or as a teacher. Enriching and contributing to the community. And how about happiness and fulfillment? Obstacle. Definition, a thing that blocks one's way or prevents or hinders progress. Lack, deficiency or absence. So what obstacles are faced by women in math? Lack of a sense of belonging. Lack of opportunities to collaborate, to speak at conferences, be journal editors. Lack of visibility. Lack of due respect for research, contributions to the department, to the community, and a lack of role models. And now we have a vicious cycle. We've got a lack of respect for women in mathematics, and in particular, of their research. And this results in a lack of opportunities and a lack of visibility for women in math, which leads to a lack of role models, and a lack of a strong sense of women belonging within the math community. And that then gives superficial credence to the lack of respect for women in math. So in my many years of being a mathematician, and all of them being a woman, I've drawn a lot of strength from various feminist singers. And one of my favorites is Sinead O'Connor. And I think this is a really great quote. If you've never seen a good time, how would you recognize one? How would you even find one? So if you've never been treated well, how do you know what it feels like to be treated well? How do you know that you're not being treated well? Belonging, acceptance as a natural member or part. And in this article that I got from Greg, why do women opt out sense of belonging and women's representation of mathematics? The authors write that sense of belonging to math, one's feeling of membership and acceptance in the math domain was established as a new and an important factor in the representation gap between males and females in math. And notice this article is from 2012, and they say this is a new factor. Odd that it wouldn't have been recognized before. And they write that first, a new scale of sense of belonging to math was created and validated, blah, blah. You know, how did they do, do this? They did a long study of calculus students. Now, I believe um, this is from the North America, and so college is meaning university, and calculus is typical first year course that we teach to all the science majors. So the, in one group, the students got the message that math ability is a fixed trait and the stereotype that women have less of this ability than men, and this worked to erode the women's, but not the men's, sense of belonging in math. And their lowered sense of belonging mediated their desire to pursue math in the future and their math grades, which I think is interesting. The message that math ability could be acquired protected women in the other group from negative stereotypes, allowing them to maintain a high sense of belonging in math and the intention to pursue math in the future. Opportunity, another definition favorable or advantageous circumstance or combination of circumstances, a time or set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. Collaborate, to work together, especially in a joint intellectual effort. And then I couldn't resist another definition, to cooperate treasonably, as with an enemy. Okay, well collaborations can be really great for generating new ideas, and bringing together complementary skill sets, as with collaborating with an enemy, right? Um, and it can also bring women collaborators a greater sense of belonging to the math community. 
but every silver lining has a cloud. Often when a woman has a male collaborator, especially one who's more senior, people will, some people at least, will say or think that the man had all the important ideas and insights or the greater technical skill. And another, another difficulty women sometimes face is finding suitable collaborators. In this article, The Matilda Effect in Science Communication, an experiment on gender bias in publication quality perceptions and collaboration interest. The authors write, they did an experiment with 243 young communication scholars testing hypotheses. Um, regarding impacts of gender and gender typing of research topics on perceived quality of scientific publications and collaboration interest. Participants rated conference abstracts ostensibly authored by females or males with author associations rotated. The abstracts fell into research areas perceived as gender typed or gender neutral to ascertain impacts of the gender typing of topics. And publications from male authors were associated with greater scientific quality, in particular, if the topic was male typed. Collaboration interest was highest for male authors working on male typed topics. And respondent sex did not alter these patterns, meaning the women answered the same way as the men. Respect. A feeling of admiration for someone or something elicited by their abilities, qualities, or achievements. Ambivalence, the state of having mixed feelings or contradictory ideas about someone or something. In mathematics, as in other male-dominated professions, there is much evidence that women are subjected to gender-biased evaluations, often having their performances and contributions devalued and their competence denied. In this article, Penalties for Success, Reactions to Women Who Succeed at Male Gender Typed Tasks, they did three experiments, a total of 242 subjects, and from their abstract, results strongly supported the author's hypotheses indicating that when women are acknowledged to have been successful, they are less liked and more personally derogated than equivalently successful men. These negative reactions occur only when the success is in an arena that is distinctly male in character. And being disliked can have career affecting outcomes both for overall evaluation and for recommendations concerning organizational reward allocation. These stereotypes prompt bias in evaluative judgments of women even when these women have proved themselves to be successful and demonstrated their com competence. And another article, the impact of gender on the review of the CV of job applicants and tenure candidates. So they sent 238 male and female academics, one of four versions of a CV, female job applicant, male job applicant, female tenure applicant, male tenure applicant, and actually all of these CVs came from a real life scientist at two different stages in her career. Names changed to traditional male and female names. And this woman also had been promoted early, uh, tenured early. Both men and women were more likely to vote to hire a male job applicant than a female job applicant with an identical record. Similarly, both sexes reported that the male job applicant had done adequate teaching, research, and service experience compared to the female job applicant with an identical record. And the abrasiveness trap. High achieving men and women are described differently in reviews. This woman working in the tech industry collected 248 reviews, um, 141 by men, 107 by women. So those are the people who wrote the reviews. Reviewing 180 people, 105 men, 75 women, all working in the tech industry. And feedback received in critical reviews. In the reviews of men, 2% of the reviews had negative feedback, 81% had only positive feedback, so I guess there's also neutral feedback. Um, 
I read the whole article. That was not commented on. In the reviews of women, 71% of the reviews had negative feedback and 23% had only positive feedback. Reviews including critical feedback in the reviews of men, 58% were without criticism. In the reviews of women, 13% were without criticism. Men and women both received criticism, such as there were a few cases where it would have been extremely helpful if you had gone deeper. Oops, ha, didn't catch that typo, sorry. And take time to slow down and listen, you would achieve even more. However, the author writes that the women's reviews include another sharper element, two quotes from those reviews. You can come across as abrasive sometimes. I know you don't mean to, but you need to pay more attention to your tone. Your peers sometimes feel that you don't leave them enough room. Sometimes you need to step back to let others shine. The author writes that this kind of negative personality criticism shows up in two of the 83 critical reviews received by men. You want to take bets on what the next numbers will be? 71 of the 94 critical reviews received by women. Glass ceiling definition an unacknowledged discriminatory barrier that prevents women and minorities from rising to positions of power or responsibility as within a corporation. And from Wikipedia, the glass ceiling metaphor has often been used to describe invisible barriers, thus glass, through which women can see elite positions but cannot reach them, thus ceiling. And these barriers prevent large numbers of women and ethnic minorities from obtaining and securing the most powerful, prestigious, and highest grossing jobs in the workforce. And moreover, this effect may make women feel that they are not worthy to fill high-ranking positions or as if their bosses do not take them seriously or see them as potential candidates for advancement. From the book Why So Slow by Vir Virginia Vallian, she writes, you can get some of this on Kindle for free. I haven't found the whole book yet, somewhere in my husband's office. Um, I want to explain women's lack of achievement in situations where nothing seems to be wrong. Even in apparently egalitarian environments, women do not advance as far or as rapidly as men. Something invisible limits their progress. The central thesis of this book is that a set of implicit or non-conscious hypotheses about sex differences plays a central role in shaping men's and women's professional lives. These hypotheses, which she coins the phrase gender schemas, affect our expectations of men and women, our evaluations of their work, and their performances as professionals. Both men and women hold the same gender schemas and begin acquiring them in early childhood. Their most important consequence for professional life is that men are consistently overrated while women are underrated. And just a little anecdote here recently on Desert Island Discs, Nancy Rothwell related her observations that when a woman looks at a job ad, she's likely to say, I can't do maybe half of that, I won't apply. A man looking at the same job ad is likely to say, I can do maybe half of that, I will apply. Extending the metaphor of the glass ceiling, the glass cliff describes the phenomenon whereby individuals belonging to particular groups are more likely to be found in leadership positions that are associated with greater risk of failure and criticism. So this term was coined by this team of researchers at Exeter. They were particularly, particularly looking at men and women and other minority groups taking on leadership roles in industry in corporations, and they found that women executives in the corporate world were likelier than men to be put into leadership positions during periods of crisis or downturn when the chance of failure is highest. Okay, we can try to put a positive spin on this thing. We're the only ones who can save it. Uh, doesn't always work out that way with the research, what the research shows. So from Wikipedia, this research showed that once women break through the glass ceiling and take on positions of leadership, they often have experiences that are different from those of their male counterparts. More specifically, women are likely to occupy positions that are precarious, thus have a higher risk of failure, 
either because they are appointed to lead organizations that are in crisis or because they are not given the resources and support needed for success. Evidence of the glass cliff phenomenon has been documented in business, politics, law, public service, education, and sport. A 2006 study found law students were much likelier to assign a high risk case to a female lead counsel rather than a male one. And a 2010 study found undergraduate students in British political science likelier to select a male politician to run for a safe seat in a by-election and much likelier to select a female candidate when the seat was described as hard to get. Bullying. One definition, bullying occurs when one person, typically but not necessarily, in a position of power, authority, trust, responsibility, management, etc., feels threatened by another person, usually but not always a subordinate, who is displaying qualities of ability, popularity, knowledge, skill, strength, drive, determination, tenacity, success, and so on. And too often women in male-dominated fields, such as mathematics, become the targets of bullies. From this resource, Bully Online, examples of bullying include constant nitpicking, fault finding, and criticism of a trivial nature. And while there might be a grain of truth in all of this, the criticism is based on distortion, misrepresentation, or fabrication. Persistent refusal to acknowledge the target and his or her level con of contributions and achievements or to recognize their existence and value. Constant attempts to undermine the target and his or her position of status, worth, value, and potential. Being isolated and separated, excluded, marginalized, overruled, ignored, sidelined, frozen out being singled out and treated differently. You know, when I was up for tenure at Colorado, I said, stop giving me the special treatment. Please go by the rules. Had to hire a lawyer to make them go by their own rules. They did tenure me. <laughs> being belittled, demeaned, patronized, humiliated, shouted at, and threatened, overloaded with work, or having all your meaningful work taken away, replaced with menial tasks, having responsibility increased but authority removed, having leave refused, being denied training or other opportunities necessary to fulfill duties or to excel, having unrealistic goals set or deadlines changed, being the subject of gossip which has the effect of damaging one's reputation. What gossip has the effect of improving one's reputation? <laughs> Having what one say, says and does twisted, distorted, and misrepresented, subject to disciplinary procedures for trivial or fabricated reasons without proper investigation or with sham investigation, being the target of specious allegations of misconduct or incapability, which again might lend a, superficially lend legitimacy to allegations. Okay. As a young woman in math, I would talk to other women in math at conferences and they would start to tell horror stories. And so I started asking them, how'd you survive? So I wanted to survive. So I started collecting a lot of these stories and everything in this list I had on my list before I even found this website. And over the years, having continued to collect this, what I found is that for all of us who've gone through this kind of bullying, our first reaction was, I must be crazy. Because no one around me seems to think something's wrong with how I'm being treated. Every single woman that I talked to, they started with that. I thought I was crazy. It's important to realize when you're being bullied or treated unfairly. Um, I would add to this list of examples I gave you from Bully Online, hostility, in the form of glares, sneers, nasty and malicious attitudes masqueraded as jokes, disparagement as a researcher, she's a good teacher but not really a researcher, or she doesn't deserve her grant. When I got told that, I wondered why I worked so hard on writing the grant. You know, I could have just opened the photocopier or photoed that I was a woman, photocopied I was a woman and stapled a budget to the end of that. 
And the other one, she probably just typed that co-authored paper, especially if it's with a man. I wrote a, a couple of papers with Kathy Merrill, who's an analyst. And we would joke that everyone in analysis would say that I did all the work, and everyone in number theory would say that she did all the work. And we weren't really joking. Another thing on my list, prejudicial comments to students, faculty, staff, and administrators saying you are an uncooperative colleague or a bad influence or telling the administration you are responsible for problems in your department. And physical intimidation, bodily backing you up against a wall to disparage or attack you, staring at your breasts during conversations. And perpetual condescension. And this is common and pernicious, and it can really undermine your confidence, introduce strong self-doubt, cause you to lose hope, and impact your ambition. And another emotion often experienced by the target of unfair treatment or bullying is anger. But you can use this. Don't let it destroy you. You can actually use this to help you. And here's a good quote from another one of my feminist favorite singers, Ani DeFranco. I sing sometimes for the war that I fight because every tool is a weapon if you hold it right. So what can you do if you're being targeted by a bully? Well, you need to fight back. You need to find strong people and get a strong and supportive community. And you need to fight for yourself as well as for a larger goal so that you don't just get consumed by how horrible your situation is and lose perspective and feel more hopeless. And importantly, if you're a researcher, you need to continue doing research. So I recommend the Bully Online resource and I also have a paper on surviving as a woman in math. Um, and it's on my website. And as a community, we have responsibility we need to recognize and acknowledge our own implicit biases, and we need to work really hard to take these into account when we're hiring, when we're looking at making promotions, making awards, choosing conference speakers, and recognize that women in math are a scarce commodity, commodity and respond according, bleh, accordingly. And at Michigan, University of Michigan, where my husband was for a long time, this is the attitude that they took. And so they would recruit really excellent women and they'd offer them higher salary, lower teaching load, more startup money to make the jobs attractive. And guess what? They got a lot of really good women mathematicians in their department. And I would say on average, the women in that department are better researchers than the men. They recognized a scarce commodity and responded accordingly. We need to create comfortable working environments and support people by first finding out what they actually want and not deciding we know better than they do. Identify role models as well as other people who are supportive of women. Encourage or create mentoring or research connections. And challenge, don't coddle women students and researchers. We don't help our talented women students when we do their work for them, the way we would not do for a male student. And that often results in the women not really believing in their own talents because we're not treating them as though we believe in their talents. Um, I didn't think I was gonna do a PhD and certainly not in math. And my advisor would say to me, okay, you know what you're supposed to do? Go, get out of here, go do it. I thought, I can't do that. But I didn't want to disappoint him. And so I went and turned out I could do it. And I talked to other female graduate students that he's had and they had the exact same experience. So it was great. One thing that we really need to look at and that we have a lot of influence over is inviting more women to speak at conferences, seminars, and colloquia. Okay, why don't we have more women speakers? Well, here's some things I've heard. Women just don't work in this area. I asked the two famous women in this field and they were both busy. Well, I thought of asking, you can choose how to fill in that blank, but figured, I figured she wouldn't come because she has children. I never heard of the women who were suggested. 
the women in this area just aren't good speakers, like every man is. <laughs> okay, and here's another great thing I found. I don't know how well you can read this, I think pretty well. Female conference speaker, bingo. This is about why there aren't more women speaking at STEM conferences. And let's see, some of my favorites. Trying to get more female speakers is sexist. Um, you can't kick out a male speaker just to fit a woman in there. And, well, there aren't that, that many women, or there aren't that many female attendees either. Okay, in the US, this issue of lack of women speakers at math conferences and STEM conferences has been addressed to some extent by National Science Foundation. They linked money to the issue. You can't get conference funding from NSF unless you have women on your list. And then people started having to invite women. And then their attitudes started changing too. I really did not believe that was gonna happen. I was really pleased to see, wow, it worked. However, sometimes what I've seen is that it's just the same few women who get invited over and over without attempts to look for new women in the field, women who've moved into that field and give more people opportunities. A friend of mine at Santa Barbara used to say, he didn't think that the idea of affirmative action was passing around Karen Uhlenbeck. Ooh, ooh, I'll take her now. <laughs> okay, another successful technique that was used by one of my colleagues at Bristol, Jens Markloff, he began by only inviting women. And when he had the targeted number of women ex having accepted the invitations to come, then and only then did he start inviting men and he continued to invite women and his target was 50% women. This is in ergodic theory and I'm, I'm not convinced that there are way more women in ergodic theory than in number theory. And the American Institute of Math has a policy that at least 20% of the participants, participants of any of their workshops have to be women. And they get, they run, I think it's 24 workshops a year, and they get organizers that say, oh, well, no, we could only come up with, you know, one. And so what they've done is they create, they've created and then maintained this database of women in math and they've sorted it according to research areas. So when these conference organizers say, ah, there aren't any, they say, okay, what about all of these women? And Brian Conry is the director of this institute and years ago when I was working at NSF and he was a new, this was a new institute and he was there with the other math institute directors. He said, look, we're creating this database with all the women in math and don't you guys, want to share it. We can give you free access. You know, we're doing it anyway. We're not asking for any money. Don't you want access? Nah. <laughs> Disappointing. We need to make the inclusion of women speakers a recognized and articulated priority. So we need to be willing to include women who work on problems related to the focus of the conference, as well as those who work on problems central to the focus. And this is a reference to Greg Martin's article that we were mentioning before. And this is not a typo. It really is Gerg. <laughs> and so this article started from a co uh, email correspondence he was having with some conference organizers about where are all, all the women on your list? How come there aren't more women? And they had their excuses and I encouraged him to published this and he did an amazing job of expanding it even more and he's got a list of 95 references and he also has an annotated bibliography with all those references so I got a lot of these references from there and in his article he analyzes and refutes genetic explanations for having few women in STEM disciplines he actually uses statistics with the data that's available and he investigates implicit biases, drawing on numerous scholarly articles, some of which I've shown you bits of. And then he presents and expounds upon the following guidelines. Plan from the beginning. Communicate expectations and goals among planners. Come up with names. Select speakers attentively. Create equitable logistics. 
walk the walk, and talk the talk. Okay, as he writes, this unfairness can be reduced and eventually eliminated, both by taking deliberate steps to fully include women in our scientific activities, and by focusing attention critically on the unfairness itself. Moreover, in addition to resulting in appropriate inclusion of female mathematicians, we believe that thoughtful adoption of these guidelines will quite simply lead to better conferences, independently of speakers' genders. Okay, Athena Swan. My department at Bristol has been working on an Athena Swan bronze application. And my shock in coming here in 2007 from being in the US for many years was how much the universities here just engage in box ticking exercises. And so I wonder, will Athena Swan help bring equality to the treatment of women in mathematics? So I'm gonna show you some more definitions. Equality, the state of being equal, especially in status, treatment, rights, and opportunities. Token, done for the sake of appearances or as a symbolic gesture. Placebo, a medicine or procedure prescribed for the psychological benefit to the patient rather than for any physiological effect. Facade, a deceptive outward appearance. Skepticism, a doubting or questioning attitude or state of mind. And finally, here's another quote. I will let you read from Annie DeFranco, Willing to Fight. And I think this is a great quote emphasizing that as a community, we need to get involved in fighting against injustice. You can't just think about yourself and whether your situation is okay. You need to think about your whole community And finally, my picture from the first page, Four Heroes in Math. Okay, so now it's time for a quiz. I'm also really tired of the passivity of my British students. <laughs> quizzes, in-class quizzes. This is an actress playing the role of early Greece. Hypatia. Yes. <laughs> and what's the story of her? Her father was a mathematician. Um, People came from miles around to hear her teachings. Uh, there are sources that suggest that, well, she only, you know, tried to study what her father did and make mild corrections. But other sources refute that, saying she was the stronger mathematician. And how did she die? She was murdered by, murdered by Christians, right? Because <laughs> bad. Okay. <laughs> Man, <laughs> teacher's pet. <laughs> Sophie Germain, and I love the story about her being sick. Well, she had to stay inside. There's also unrest. And so she started reading books in her father's library, and she found these books on math, and she thought they were really cool. Well, her parents decided that this was not OK. And so she started getting up in the night after her parents had gone to bed, gone to sleep, lighting candles and reading the math books at late at night. And her parents found out she was doing this, so they took away her candles. <laughs> so then she started pocketing little bits of candles any chance she had and kept doing this. So then she wanted to study math at university. And of course, at that time, women were not allowed. But people could get lecture notes if they wrote for them, so she made up a male name and started getting lecture notes. And then she started writing to some of these famous mathematicians and eventually was outed as a woman. And she was extremely ambitious. I think it was amazing that she was more discouraged than these other women. Then we'll get, we'll get to the last two. She was more discouraged by her parents than the other women. And she was, I think, the most determined and the most ambitious of these four. 
Okay. Uh, you're you're early. Yes. Um, I think it was Heidelberg. She was allowed to go to classes, and then uh, Fire Strauss took her as his personal tutee because wherever she was then, she wasn't allowed to go to the math classes and study math. And she was involved in some political things too, so had some time out of doing math, but then went back to doing math. And now, Can we yes, <laughs> her father was a mathematician. I think she had to sit behind a screen in the math lecture rooms so that she could go to the lectures, but the men didn't have to see her. But it'd be pretty hard to see the blackboard, wouldn't it, if you're behind a screen? Um, so she was very generous with her ideas and loved to collaborate with people and would let them take credit. You know, she loved to have these big discussions and then she didn't care if her name was on these papers. And of course she had to leave Europe before World War II when things were getting unsettled. She went to the U.S. Artin was trying to get her a job at Princeton at the Institute and they were having none of it. And so she finally got a job at Bryn Mawr and I'm pretty sure that's why they have a PhD program in math at Bryn Mawr. And so it's as not that far seeming to those of us who are American also live in cars to get from Bryn Mawr to the Institute, but I'm sure it wasn't that easy at the time. And my last story about these women, since I ended early, okay, two stories actually. Um, what's her name? I heard a woman giving a talk, woman mathematician, giving a talk about being a woman in math. And she said, okay, Mary Ellen Rudin, that's who it was. She said that there's a joke that there were only ever two women mathematicians, and one really wasn't a mathematician, and the other wasn't really a woman. Talking about not really a mathematician because she's beautiful, not really a woman because she's not. There was a poster, Men in Mathematics, that came with calculus books to US departments, so textbook industry there is huge. And so if a department had ordered a certain calculus book from that publisher for their students, then they sent the department this timeline of Men in Mathematics, titled that, they actually did have Emmy Nutter on the timeline. They, for under each of the men, they described something about their mathematics and what area they were in. For Emmy Nutter, the description was, she was known to be fat and loud. Not clear why she was on the poster since it said nothing about her math. So, we need to do better. And thank you for your attention and for the invitation.